Not only is it the only first Arkansas-based baby food company, but the mom who created it says all the ingredients come from Northwest Arkansas farms. I was working for a local television station as a broadcast news reporter. And then I met Dave. <laughs> and her whole world changed. <laughs> Somebody invited me to Seattle just to learn about church planning for three days. Really instantly got gripped by this sense of lostness and darkness. Yeah, it's really just well known for a lot of new age, kind of Eastern religion. But if God's called us to this place, He's called us to plant our lives here. We did feel like God gave us a great affirmation and a sense of peace for mm -hmm. this particular spot for us to do His work. I just began going to a local park and I would meet moms and just talk. That really mm -hmm. set the groundwork for building these relationships that became friendships. Mm -hmm. And then we began meeting in our home and then it grew. And then we made two groups Yeah. and then that group. God really opened up doors at the community center. And so when we got there, we met in one little room in the community center and we took the doors, you know, the sliding doors and we met in two rooms. And then last fall, we moved to the gymnasium. Yeah, we have anywhere from 75 to 95 people on a Sunday morning. So it's exciting. We're, it's, it's thriving. When people give to missions, it may seem like this very generic offering, but it turns into very significant things that we can utilize to better help us do our ministry and our work here. I was a journalist, I was a news reporter, and, and those things defined me. God stripped all of that away, and so it taught me to find my identity in Christ. Because when we came up here, I, I didn't feel capable. You know, like Jesus and the fishermen, he was like, come on, I'm gonna call you, be fishers of men. It's truth. Mm -hmm. And when we are able to just share that truth with people, it literally gives them hope. Good morning. Good. I hope you're seeing me. I'm not seeing you. I miss seeing you. If you're watching today, we're just glad that you've tuned in uh, to this, this uh, again, this new normal that we were calling. Uh, just know that we come today and we look. Again, we're Jan Lee Baptist Church. Our mission statement is transforming our community by leading people to know and imitate Jesus. Uh, you just saw an Annie Armstrong uh, Easter offering video. Uh, this is something that that annual event for us around this this springtime around Easter. Our goal is seven hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, just encourage you, encourage you to give. You saw that as church planners, and really I know that North American missions now has really become international missions in the sense that the world has come to us, come to our shores, and we reach out with the gospel through there. So so uh, just be generous in, in your giving to that. I also want to welcome you and, and invite you to uh, our Wednesday evening Bible study and prayer at 6 o'clock. We did something a little different last week. Robert and I were up here, and uh, we did a discussional Bible study and invite you to be a part of that. Uh, we look forward to the day where we can all be together in the same room and do that. Um, but right now, that's, that's what we're doing. I think you'll be blessed by it. Um, our local missions, uh, Grace Ministries, uh, was down there the other day. The, let me tell you, the people down there are doing a great job. They're, they're all older people. They're doing, they've got a great plan to protect themselves and still meet the need in our community. But we need, have the need to can meat and canned um, uh, meals like SpaghettiOs and things like that. If you would give. Uh, it's not on here, but let me also, too, we sent out a message about the blessing boxes that are around town at the Catholic Church, the Methodist Church, and over by Providence. Um, you know, those things are getting emptied several times a day. So if you have a chance to uh, just a, a finger type food or a, a grab and go type food to, to supply there. Uh, my wife and I did that. Kathy and I did that last night, went around and added to those blessing boxes so people could come uh, with that. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. It is going to be a great, great service that we're going to have. We've asked some of you, we're going to do like at Christmas where we do the scripture song service. Um, and uh, we're, we've asked some of you to, to read and uh, record that and send that in. I think, I think it'll be a, just a blessing to, to tell the story of Jesus from beginning to end uh, to the second coming uh, next week. Part of that, we're going to do um, communion. 
uh, it's going to be different. We have purchased these small uh, communion cups. Maybe you can see it on screen. On top, there's a little wafer on that that's all sealed. Um, just when we get to a place in the service where Jesus established the, the Lord's Supper, that we're going to stop and you'll be in your home and you will take the Lord's Supper together. Uh, you need to get these. Uh, either come by, you can call the church and say, hey, I'm going to come by and pick up these. Or if you need be, call and say, we can deliver them and, and drop them off at your house if that's necessary. But we encourage you to participate uh, with us in that. Let me say this. Uh, understand what, what we believe about the Lord's Supper. We believe that salvation comes before baptism. That we are saved and then we are baptized in an act of obedience. And taking the Lord's Supper comes after baptism. So, so understand that. Understand that. that that's, uh, if you're saved, if you've been baptized, we, per, we invite you to participate with us in that. It's a great opportunity to evangelize your kids, to tell them and talk about the meaning with that of this uh, event, um, with that, uh, doing that. So again, encourage you to, to plan on being a part of that next week. The last thing I want to talk about is just these um, cloth masks, no guarantee cloth mask uh, or button uh, headband. Uh, you can contact Debbie Ritter or the church office. They just have those. You know that Now they're encouraging us to wear those, not so much to protect ourselves, but to protect other people. And uh, those are available. Again, I welcome you today. I'm glad you're here. Remember your church and your offering also. And um, uh, don't forget your tithes and offerings as we continue to operate. If we're going to meet the need of the community, uh, we, we've got to have the financial resources to do so. Thank you. Worship team. Good morning. Let us pray. Father God, we are a thankful people. Father, we're thankful that in the midst of all this craziness going on around us, you are still in control. <clears throat> you know everything that we need. Father, you are providing for us. You are loving us. You're continuing to move in this country, and we thank you for that. May we praise your name this morning in all that we say and do. Amen. Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious, and we will lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of our Lord God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. O oh Lord, save the King. Answer us when we call.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come and give you praise because you are worthy of all praise. Father, we just ask now that you would just bless this time. We ask, Lord, that you would bless your word as it goes out. We ask now that you'd move in a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Today is Palm Sunday. And I want to read our Bible story this morning. Jesus was traveling with his disciples in Jerusalem. As he came to the Mount of Olives outside a village called Bethpage, Jesus instructed two of his disciples to go into the village where they would find a donkey tied with a coat. Jesus told the disciples to untie the animals and bring them to him. He told the men that if anyone asks what they were doing, they should say that the Lord needs the animals. This happened to fulfill the word of God that was written hundreds of years before. The prophecy said, look, your king is coming, riding on a young donkey. The disciples followed Jesus' instructions. They brought the donkey and the coat, put the robes on them, and Jesus sat on top of them. As Jesus rode, a large crowd of people spread the robes on the road. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road too. Crowds of people went in front of him and followed after him. They shouted, Hosanna is the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up and asked, Who is this? The crowd replied, This is Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. I want to lead us in, boys and girls, I want to lead us in two songs this morning. First one is, this is the day that the Lord has made. And the other one is, if the devil don't like it, he can set on attack. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. And if the devil don't like it, he can sit on attack. Out, sit on attack. Out, sit on attack. Out. If the devil don't like it, he can sit on attack. Sit on attack to stay. Amen. Um, boys and girls, if you get permission from mom and dad, I want you to write your favorite scripture work verse on your sidewalk or on your driveway at home. My, one of my favorite verses I wrote was John 4.18 at home this morning. So I wanna encourage you, take a piece of chalk, get mom and dad's permission, go write your verse on the sidewalk, the driveway and you may want to get the whole family out there now I want to speak to the adults when's the last time you wrote on the sidewalk when's the last time you wrote on your driveway adults 
mom and dad, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas, if you're able, get a piece of chalk, go outside, write your favorite scripture verse on your sidewalk or your driveway. And if you're not able, get someone to write it for you. And if you get permission, you may want to put it on Facebook. May the Lord bless you and your family. Father, we praise you for who you are. Father, first and foremost, you are our Lord and our Savior. You are our hope. And Lord, we live in a world that needs that right now, a foundation of security to put their hope and their trust in. Lord, we know that you're it. You are our hope. And so we come this morning to, to worship you, to honor you. I pray for our pastor right now, Father, that you anoint him with the ability to share your word. Father, that you use him to speak truth this morning. Father, we want to bring honor and glory to you today. So bless this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I much rather preach than give announcements, I tell you. <laughs> I, I get up there and do that and I just... Uh, makes me cringe but there's things we need to know right there's things we need to know so glad you're here again today turn with me in your bibles to daniel chapter five um, i had a pastor friend several years ago he's f from pakistan uh, i've told this story to our church before they know this but we were talking one time and he, one of the things he said he said you know you american christians are nice you're nice and he didn't necessarily mean that as a compliment he said, one of the things y'all don't like to do is tell people hard things. You don't like to say it. I mean, there's some things, some truths in the Bible that are difficult to say. And you know what? I have to agree with them. I, and I don't say it from pointing at you. I point at me. It is difficult. Recently, I went in and got a bad diagnosis from a doctor. It was, you know, the doctor had to do something. If he, you know, he could have said, well, that's bad news. I don't think I want to tell him. I don't like telling him. I shouldn't say that. But you know what? It admit, it's to my detriment for him to have kept that to himself. He needed to say, you have this and we need to deal with it. So in the same way, spiritually, spiritually, there are times we need to say hard things. Our passage today out of Daniel chapter 5 is Daniel saying difficult things to a person. And so we turn to this, and, and, and let, me, let me just read out of this, and we're going to go back and tell the story a little bit, because this Daniel really uh, lends itself very well, very well to the idea of, of a story, and again, in this. But we're going to look at verse 22, verse 22, Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 5, verse 22, and start there and read um, down uh, through the end of the chapter. But it says this, But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself... Though you knew all this, instead you set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. 
You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze and iron, wood and stone, which cannot, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life in all your ways. Therefore, he sent his hand that wrote on the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Perez. This is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple a gold chain placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of ba the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you even the difficult things that are said in scriptures. But Lord, we know we have hope in the good news. Father, we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. We come in again look at this, this story. Last week we talked about where Daniel, uh, again, had that uh, time that, that, again, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had another dream, and it was a dream of, of, of that the interpretation of that dream was that he was going to go insane uh, because of his arrogance and his pride before God that God allowed him. And for seven years he wandered in the, with the animals out uh, uh, around, but finally he said he came to himself and he... he repented of that arrogance and he humbled himself before God and God restored him until that time. What we find in, in Daniel 5 is some time has passed. Some time has passed and, and in that what we find here is this, this um, uh, idea here, the king uh, of, of, and you see this basically a, a, a family tree the kings of Babylonian Empire, and what you find is, is Nebuchadnezzar was the, the first king, the, the father of Nebuchadnezzar, who, who was the greatest king and reigned 43 years. After he died in six, uh, 562 B.C., uh, you see a time where his children were trying to take over, and there's basically a, a, a nine-year reign, uh, a, a rapid turnover of people, until uh, Belshazzar comes along. That is not the son of Nebuchadnezzar, but rather his grandson. Uh, the scripture, in that language, there, there is not the means of referring to a grandfather. And so when it calls him a father, that, that idea, that meaning behind that, Belshazzar, though, uh, comes uh, into power and reigns for, 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 again, 14 years until the Medes and Persians. But we call it a time, and I put quotations to mark the runs of stability in the sense that you had one ruler, but I don't know how th stable things were. You see, Belshazzar was nowhere near what Nebuchadnezzar was. Matter of fact, what we find in this is that uh, there are some things in Belshazzar's story with him. First of all, Belshazzar was a guy who lived to party. He lived to party. That was that attitude. I, I'm reminded of, of watching the news at the beginning of this coronavirus where lots of people went out on spring break anyways. They went to, to go to spring break, and I remember them interviewing one young man, and he simply said, I live to party. I live to party. I'm here, and I'm not afraid of the coronavirus, and I'm really not afraid of who I give it to because my life is about partying. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's kind of Belshazzar's attitude toward that. He, he lived to party. But, but not only that, we find that he, he was sacrilegious. What do I mean by sacrilegious? He took the sacred things of God and misused them. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, uh, laid siege to Jerusalem, and again, Jerusalem was being judged by God for their unfaithfulness, and, and God allowed that to happen, and God... Uh, allowed Nebuchadnezzar to take Jerusalem. He took the temple. He destroyed the temple, but he took artifacts from that temple and put it in his own treasury. God allowed that to happen as an act of judgment against Israel. But what Belshazzar did is he comes to a place in his drunkenness and in his party spirit, and he takes, and he's got this big party. There were times, the archaeologists said there were times maybe up to 15,000 people dining 
with uh, these kings at one time in this big party and took those and allowed his wives and concubines and nobles to drink from those sacred cups. Now let me say this. Those cups in and of themselves, because they were gold and silver, were not sacred. They were sacred simply who they had been dedicated to. That's what made them sacred. There was no sacred in a gold cup or anything like that. It was sacred in that they had been set apart for God. And he came, and not only did he allow them to drink, but they used them in an acts of worship to foreign gods. He was sacrilegious in this. But not only that, was he sacrilegious, he was superstitious. And we're going to say this story here. Now, it comes in, and it talks about what happens, and it's referred to in the, in the passage that we read. But it says that a hand came upon the wall, and, and, and there was a large hand that was writing on the wall, and it wrote these words, and it said that it terrified, it terrified Belshazzar. Matter of fact, the, the, the one version, one translation says that he literally soiled himself. He was so scared. His knees knocked together. He was frightened by this. And seeing something like that, and rather, let me tell you what, I believe, I'm going to tell you today, I believe there was a hand, that, the hand of God, whether through an angel, whatever it was, that wrote on that wall, and Belshazzar saw it. Some of you may say, well, I have a hard time believing that, but let me tell you what, I got what Frank Turek says in, in his apologetic about God in, in defending the faith. He said, the greatest miracle is what? He said, not the resurrection, although that's great and necessary, but the, the greatest miracle is creation. Once you believe that God created the heavens and the earth, anything else is possible. Anything else is possible. And, and again, at this point, God coming and, and imparting in a very specific way to Belshazzar that you've done something that has offended me. And he responds to that. And I say his superstition came from the fact that he calls his magicians, his diviners, those ones. And again, this fear. Rather than looking at something and saying, what does this mean? What do I need to do? He comes in a place of fear. They can't interpret those words for him or the meaning of those words uh, that we read earlier. But what they do, his mother, the queen, it says, comes and tells him there is somebody who can do this. I want you to know when it says the queen in this passage, if you read that whole fifth chapter, most likely not referring to a wife, but his mother and even possibly his grandmother. The queen mother that came in and again interpreted and said, there is someone who can do that. Daniel, after the death of Nebuchadnezzar, may have been relegated to, to some lesser role. Maybe he was just living out his life. He was an older man at this point. But, but he comes and it's interesting that, that uh, he's called and everything, but... What we're going to find, too, and we'll talk about this later, is that Nebuch or Belshazzar was a fatalist. He was fatalistic in his view in, in the fact that he didn't feel like he could turn any place to turn in what was happening. What we do want to look at, though, is this. Speaking truth in a troubled world through Daniel's example. Daniel was called in. Daniel, the, the, the prophet Daniel, the, the man Daniel was called in. Again, the queen mother said, there's a person who can do this, and Daniel is brought in to, to speak truth to this king. One of the first things we see here is that Daniel maintained uh, all that time his reputation. Daniel had a reputation from, from uh, the very beginning when he came, uh, was taken to Babylon as a young man, and all through those years he maintained his reputation. Even when he fell from, from grace, if you want to call it, from the king's favor after Nebuchadnezzar died and was living, he maintained, and we're going to see next week, actually in two weeks, uh, his prayer life as he does that through, again, as an old man. He maintains his reputation in, in the calling in our lives, too, to when we're going through these difficult times that we set the example in our reputation. We have a reputation of being godly people. We have a reputation of speaking truth. We have a, a reputation of being faithful to the things God has called us to. Another thing we find in Daniel is Daniel used discernment. In that story, again, it says that, uh, you know, Daniel didn't seek Nebuchadnezzar out. I'm thinking of the, what Jesus said in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 6. He says that, don't cast your pearls before swine or give what's holy to dogs. In that, again, that's not calling anybody pigs or dogs. What it is calling, saying is that, 
uh, be careful where you take the sacred things of God and where you put them. Because let me tell you what, before this happened, Belshazzar could, wouldn't have appreciated Daniel's words at all. Matter of fact, he might have turned on Daniel and killed Daniel uh, for saying that. But at this time, he, when, when it came time, the right time for Daniel to speak, he was brought before the king. He used discernment. He didn't feel there was a time and a place, again, to come and speak to this man in his profanity, in his sacrilegious state. So again, Daniel used discernment. Another thing, Daniel refused the quid pro quo. That's a term we hear a lot now today in our political world. And what that is, is that Belshazzar's offering gifts and offerings and, and, and special attention to, to somebody. And Daniel tells him, he just says, you can keep your stuff. You can keep it. I, I don't need payment to tell you the truth. Matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you. Now, he... We're going to find he does. Eventually, as those things are, 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 are cast upon him, he's given that. But it's one that it is not a requirement to, to receive those things to tell Belshazzar the truth. So Daniel, again, he, he refuses the quid pro quo offer. Another thing, he, he reminds Belshazzar of his history. You see, at that point, right before we read that passage, he goes back and reminds him of his grandfather. He said, your grandfather was a powerful man. Matter of fact, he held uh, life and death over, over his whole kingdom. He, he was a powerful man and made these decisions, yet in his arrogance, God judged him that he might bring grace to him. That he might bring grace to him. You see, if, he had, if God would have left Nebuchadnezzar in his arrogance, he would have never been saved. He allowed him to experience a difficult time. And, and in that, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came to a place where he humbled himself before the Lord, repented for the Lord, and, and I believe became a believer and a follower of Yahweh. And I believe when he died, he went to heaven. And it says there that, again, that he tells him, this, you saw, Belshazzar, all this happen, yet you ignored it. I remind you of your history. Finally, the last thing he did is he called out sin and its consequences. He called out the sin and its consequences. He, he, he wasn't afraid to do that. And, and, and that idea, again, these words here is, is again, really just one word. Uh, your, your days are numbered. You've been weighed and measured and found wanting. Boy, there is, there, you know, there are some places where there are kings. There's one king of Israel that... God just calls a pile of poop. I don't know how else to put it. I mean, that's basically the, a real crude translation of that passage. I offered you everything, and you rejected it. And this is your, your, your pile of dung. That's a, that's a hard thing to say. And, and so, you know, you, you've been found wanting, and you're going to be judged. And finally, the kingdom is going to be divided. What we're watching here as you read this passage this is both a, a, a point in history and a change of power from the Babylonian Empire to the Medes and Persians. It's going from that land that we call Iraq to that land that we call Iran today. That, that's the shift of power that's taking place. But it is also a fulfillment of prophecy. Daniel had already prophesied this was going to happen all the way back in chapter 2. This was the first of that dream, that first dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in the statue, and, and this is a transition of power from one world power to another is taking place. And he says he's calling that out. So again, he, he, he says these things. Now, what I want to see in this is the parallel. The parallel of the New Testament. What we find, again, several years ago is I was, I was sharing the gospel with a woman who, who had a lot of these traits of Belshazzar. Let's just put it that way. I was sharing the gospel. And, and you know, one of the, one of the things I, I, I said to her was, was this. You know, everyone is destined to die once and then face the judgment. Now, I think this particular passage out of Hebrews, Hebrews was specifically talking to believers, but, but I think that's true for everybody. At some point, we're going to die and face the judgment. It's one judgment for believers. It'll be another judgment for unbelievers. But, but we face the judgment. And the truth that, that all of us, this body is going to die or Jesus is going to come back, one of the two, is a reality that we must face. She didn't like that. 
The second thing I said this, all have sinned and fall short of God's standard. Everyone. Just like what Daniel told Belshazzar. You've been weighed and majored and found wanting spiritually. You don't live up to the standard. But then I said this, the wages of sin is death. And that means in the scripture, separation from God. We are separated from God. I'm telling you, this woman put her hands over her ears and said, quit talking. I don't want to hear it. And I said, wait a minute. Let me finish. You see, I had heard a preacher one time. He was a street preacher. And he was at a, at a conference, at a youth conference. And I heard him talk. And he said he liked to do the street preaching. Street preaching. He would go to New Orleans. He said, there's all kinds of street preachers in New Orleans. And there's these guys with these big bullhorns telling everybody they're going to hell. He said, I like to stand next to them saying, yeah, but you don't have to. But you don't have to. And try to get this lady that I was talking to, let me, give me a minute. That's the bad news. You see, Daniel didn't have good news yet to give Belshazzar. We do. We have the good news of the gospel. You see, that, that's bad news. And the world needs to hear the bad news. If we don't tell them, just like that doctor, if he had said, I'm not going to tell that guy because I don't want to make him sad. I don't want to hurt his feelings. I don't want him mad at me. That would have been bad for me. And it's bad for the world if we don't tell them that. But we've got to tell them the good news. You see, the Bible also says this, that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what we're getting ready to celebrate this week, right? This is Palm Sunday, the, the, the Sunday that Jesus entered, this triumphal entry. We're going to talk about that later on when we get into the other parts of Daniel, uh, uh, about or the, pr the prediction of that, the prophecy of that event coming. And again, Daniel comes, and again, uh, that Christ, and at the end of this week, on Good Friday, what we call Good Friday, Jesus died for us. Why we're still sinners. You know what's important about that? Is all these people that remember those bad news that we don't live up to the standard? You don't have to meet the standard for Jesus to die for you. He dies you even though you don't meet the standard. Matter of fact, if you could take care of it yourself, there was no need for him to die. So again, what we find here is that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But not only that, we, we talk about the wage of sin is death. But listen to this. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. They need to hear that. That salvation is a gift. Being rescued from, from sin, from death, those things. Being rescued from that wage, that price, is a gift from God. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You only receive it as you receive a gift. And it comes through Jesus. He, he, he gave it through Jesus Christ. Uh, John, John 1.12 says, As many as received him, he gave the right to be called children of God. So again, we get a gift. I, I like to tell children when I'm sharing the gospel with a child to say, if I bought you a gift, if I bought you a gift, and I, I went and presented this to you, and I said, hey, I want you to have this. And they came and started to take it, but I pulled it back and said, wait a minute. You know, my car is really dirty. Go wash my car first. Then I'll give you this gift. There's not a kid that I've ever seen that's not understood. That's not a gift. That's not a gift. I've worked for it. The only way it's a gift is, yes, if I give it and say, here, I want you to have this. I want you to have this, and please take it. But again, they had to understand, too, to take it, make it theirs, they have to take it and receive it and desire it and want it. In the same way, God wants that for us. What he says in this, and we do that by faith. Oh, let me go back. Sorry. It says this. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Calling out to him. Again, that idea of confessing the idea of Jesus is Lord is Jesus is divine. He's God. You believe Jesus is God, and you confess it. He's God. I believe that. And not only that, but that I believe that God raised him from the dead. It, it, let me tell you, it, unless you believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, don't quit calling yourself a Christian. It is essential to the faith. Jesus could have said to his disciples, look, my spirit's going to rise. 
My ideas are going to... He could have said that. He didn't, and you know what? It could never have been proven or disproven. But he said, my body's going to rise from the dead. And you have physical evidence. Matter of fact, you don't have the physical evidence. Because if they really wanted to prove that he didn't, that they wanted to kill this Christian faith, all they had to do was produce a body, right? And they couldn't do it. So we believe Jesus rose from the dead. And again, when we call upon the name of the Lord, I, I go back, there's twice, there's two true prayers, simple prayers out of the New Testament. Uh, one is a, both out of the Gospel of Luke. One is a, is a, is a, fair, is a tax collector that, that comes and he's at the temple and he won't even lift his head to heaven and he says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And it said, Jesus said, that one went away justified. Another one on the cross next to Jesus, his prayer was simply, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Don't overcomplicate this. Don't overcomplicate this. This is the, the, the gospel that we have. And yes, God wants us to live godly lives and to have that good reputation and influence others and make disciples. That's all part of what we are. But let me tell you what the good news we need to hear is this is a gift that God gives us. Let me close with this. I saw this today. Have you seen this meme? And just like that, my pastor became a televangelist. <laughs> my daughter asked me when I was getting my jet. And uh, I don't know, my personal jet. But let me, why do I put that there? You see, we're going out live over the airways. We've had people from South Africa and, and Asia at times watching this. I don't know where this is going. And somebody is asking, again, why the importance of sharing this good news? The question is, is COVID-19 the sign of the end? People are asking that question. And I don't know. You know what? It's a plague. It is a plague that's out there. And you know what? If God tarries, there'll probably be another one because they've had them through history. So I don't know whether that is the sign or not, but let me tell you this. This is what, and you may disagree with some people on my interpretations, but this is out of Matthew 24, 14 that says, and the gospel will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. I am certainly not one to prophesy. I am not a prophet. I am not predicting at the end. I'm saying what we're doing right now is going around the world, and I'm not the only one that's become a televangelist. Almost every preacher in the United States has become a televangelist, and we are going out around the world this way. So if anything is a sign of the end, it's this. And we must not be silent. We must speak truth to a troubled world. I love Marvin's idea of going and putting that on the sidewalk. I'm going to do that, Marvin. I'm going to go out and write. I'm not sure which verse I'm going to write yet. Maybe several. <laughs> Maybe we'll write a thesis on the sidewalk. I don't know. No. I don't know. But I like that idea. Do that. That's one way uh, of speaking truth to people. I just encourage you today. I encourage you. If you care about people, I'm glad. I am glad that Dr. Told me bad news. Because you know what? Because he told me that bad news, there's good news that I can get this fixed. In the same way, when you tell people bad news, the bad news of the God, part of the gospel, you got to follow it up. But there's hope in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for, Father, just your calling in our lives. We thank you for what you've done. Father, give us, through the Spirit, give us the courage the courage to share the good news. Father, people will do with it what they want. Father, your spirit will draw them uh, uh, to you. And, but Lord, we just pray a receptivity that they, they, they were receptive to the gospel, to the good news of Jesus. I pray for those sitting on the other side, wherever they're at, Lord, today. I pray for them. I pray that you bless them. And Father, we pray this in Jesus' name.
writer of Hebrews wrote, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for being with us today.